The dualism that I want to address uh, to talk to the theme of the conference is the one between social constructionism and essentialism. Um, and that's an important uh, issue for me because it, it came up in thinking about the new approach that we took to academic tribes and territories in writing and editing uh, the 2012 book around that. So I'm going to be talking a bit about uh, disciplines and the essentialist approach towards uh, disciplines. I'm going to be concentrating on essentialism rather than social constructionism uh, because that's the key uh, issue and the key change in thinking about disciplines uh, that's, uh, that's uh, come up in rethinking the original Beecher thesis. Um, but just to say from the start that actually that duality is a bit of a false one because social, constructionist, social constructionism itself uh, can be essentialist. Uh, some socially constructed features such as language, for example, do have the characteristics of essentialism and those characteristics are that there are some core characteristics, some core features uh, of a phenomenon and that those features have uh, generative uh, characteristics, in other words, that they change other things, and that's of course true of language. It's socially constructed, it does have characteristic features, and it does have uh, influence. Uh, so it's a bit of a false uh, dichotomy or dualism, uh, but it's one that I want to address. Some of this talk uh, is indebted to work by Andrew Sayer, also here at uh, the University of uh, Lancaster. Uh, who's uh, thought quite deeply about um, essentialism and its characteristics. Um, and Sayer says that an essentialist view or an essentialist approach to social science closes down ways of thinking and alternative ways of thinking, and it creates a kind of ontological tunnel vision uh, which inhibits nuanced explanations. And I think that's absolutely true of some approaches to thinking about disciplines in general and particular disciplines and their characteristics uh, as well. Um, so uh, I'm arguing against an essentialist view, but what I'd like to argue is that a moderate form of essentialism is actually necessary. So not to move away from essentialism altogether, but to say that a kind of moderate essentialism uh, is actually absolutely vital uh, in thinking about social, social science uh, in general. Um, so uh, the original proposition of the Tribes and Territories thesis, written by Tony Beecher and published in 1989, uh, was, uh, and I've argued this in various places, an essentialist view. It argued that um, academic disciplines have particular characteristics, core characteristics, uh, that have very significant influences on other factors. So uh, the academic territories, the epistemological characteristics of disciplines, had a strong influence on academic cultures so that, for example, you could see that uh, sociologists behaved in one way in their teaching and learning, for example, uh, practices in their research, um, historians another way, um, philosophers another way. And that uh, approach, that essentialist approach, arguing for these key characteristics, core characteristics of disciplines, and the generative uh, influence of those on, in particular, culture and practices, uh, was followed up and applied by other people. So, for example, Janet uh, Donald and Ruth Newman argued that there were very clear uh, teaching and learning practices that one could identify uh, associated with uh, particular disciplines. But for my money, that approach sees disciplines in a rather static way, uh, sees them as very homogenous, and sees them as really overstates the power of disciplines in determining or at least conditioning other features. And you can see that in a lot of this, this trend of work. So for example, Donald says, psychology professors talk of, talked of developing students' capabilities through a series of courses which focus on different methods, 
In education, case studies are seen as important instructional methods to aid, aid students in making complex situations coherent. English literature professors paid attention to the analysis of text to determine the underlying assumptions, and they were concerned with the development of argument in their courses. So generalizations, even stereotypes of psychology professors, uh, education professors, English literature professors, and the different characteristics uh, are stated here. But uh, what we argue in the latest uh, version of the Tribes and Territories thesis is that actually uh, practices such as those in teaching and learning and other practices too are driven by multiple forces um, and these reshape uh, the kinds of practices that are going on in universities across all the fields of practice. So it's really difficult and in fact uh, probably rather rash uh, to try to make those kinds of generalizations. Um, so what kinds of forces are we talking about? Well, the, the, the stress on evaluation, for example, uh, both in research and learning and teaching. Technological forces have an effect on, on practices and so on. So disciplines are now only one of many factors that influence uh, practices uh, in universities. So let me just elaborate a little bit more on the nature of essentialism. I've already indicated that there are two characteristics, two key characteristics uh, of um, a phenomenon that is uh, portrayed as essentialist. One is that it has uh, core characteristics, very identifiable characteristics, which if they're not there, then the, the thing is not that thing. Uh, and the second is that um, the phenomenon has generative effects, in other words, causes other things to happen. Okay, so essentialism, ironically, is by its nature essentialist itself. Those, that description of it uh, is an essentialist description. And you can see essentialism in the way that people try to define uh, disciplines. So for example, again to quote from Janet Donald, she says that a discipline is, quote, a body of knowledge with a reasonably logical taxonomy, a specialized vocabulary, an accepted body of theory, a systematic research strategy, and techniques for replication and validity. So for Donald then, those are the key or the core characteristics of uh, a discipline. And as Beecher argues, those characteristics have effects in other areas, in research practices, teaching practices, and so on. But I think if you look at that definition, you'll see that it's a kind of disembodied abstract notion of a discipline. It kind of floats in the ether. Where is the university in that, for example? It's absent. So a discipline is seen as, as some abstract entity. And in fact, it's problematic as well. Astrology, for example, you could say, fits into that definition uh, quite well. Um, so it doesn't do uh, terribly much good in terms of a definition either. And in fact, I would argue with Anthony Giddens that if you look for disciplines in an abstract way like that, uh, you won't find them, just as Giddens argues that if you look for social structures, you won't find them. They're only visible, if you like, in their actual instantiations, in their playing out uh, in the world. If you compare Donald's definition to a social constructionist definition, to go back to this dualism, let me take Turner's uh, defini so-called definition of, of disciplines. He says, disciplines are cartels that organize markets for the production and, and employment of students by excluding those job seekers who are not the products of the cartel. So, Turner is arguing for a socially constructed nature of disciplines, but what he's saying is this is what they do. It's a statement of what disciplines do, not a real definition uh, at all. And it really doesn't give us much analytical purchase on, on uh, disciplines themselves. So um, we're left with a bit of a problem, I think, taking either the social constructionist or the essentialist uh, view, and we have no real way, for example, of distinguishing disciplines from hobbies, let's say. Um, so let's move then to away from the core characteristics to the generative power of disciplines. As I said, that was very evident in the original Tribes and Territories uh, thesis. Um, 
that the epistemological and knowledge characteristics of disciplines had effects in other areas of life. And in fact, Beecher took that quite far. He took it beyond uh, research characteristics, which were his main uh, focus, into even uh, in, into the world of hobbies. So he says, for example, quote, physicists were inclined towards an interest in the theater, art, and music, whereas the engineer's typical leisure activities included aviation, deep sea diving, and, quote, messing around in boats. So uh, that's a very strong view of the generative power of uh, disciplines. Um, and uh, uh, for my money, a, a mistaken one. Uh, but one shouldn't go to that other pole, to the social constructionist pole of this uh, dualism. As Michael Young argues, that takes you into what he calls the voice argument. In other words, that disciplines are whatever uh, somebody says, a practitioner says uh, a discipline is. And again, I think you then begin to lose the analytical power uh, that we need to actually do social science. So where does that leave us then? Well, I began to, I argued at the beginning that a, what we need is a moderate form of essentialism that doesn't take us all the way to the voice argument, to the social constructionist pole, but doesn't have the uh, closing, the closure of an, a strong essentialist uh, position. So I'd like to argue that there aren't a set of necessary core essential uh, characteristics to a discipline and to disciplines in general. And that in terms of generative power, yes, there is some generative power, but it's more like the power of a wind turbine than a power station. In other words, it varies over time according to context and so on. Um, and I would argue that we actually need a moderate uh, form of essentialism, that we can't go to the social constructionist pole. Firstly, because without that ability to do some categorizing, we won't be able to, as Star and Bauke say, sort things out. We won't be able to distinguish one thing from another, hobbies from disciplines, uh, for example. Secondly, it really is the task of social science to establish some kind of, I hate the word, but some kind of causality, in other words, to link one thing with another thing. Without that, we have no explanatory purchase. So uh, that's necessary too. And if we go st to the strong end of social constructionism, we begin to lose that, uh, as I would argue uh, postmodernists do. So in terms of be being critical, uh, seeing where, for example, structured inequalities lie and so on, um, we began, if, we, if we go too far down to the social constructionist end, uh, we lose the purchase to be able to do that. Uh, Fuchs, for example, says that the social world is, quote, a turbulent system where order and consensus emerge locally and for the time being, if at all. So that's a kind of postmodernist approach and it doesn't really give us the purchase on what I think is inevitably there, structured inequalities, which it's the job of social science to investigate. Okay, so what we want then is a nuanced depiction of academic tribes and territories that recognizes that those territories don't singularly and directly cause other uh, behavioral uh, change, um, but is able to get some kind of analytical uh, purchase. Now that's the conundrum and that's what I've been tackling over the last few months in thinking about how to uh, change, how to bring about uh, a more um, a nuanced approach to thinking about disciplines and their power. Okay, well, what I'd like to do is in fact to draw on Wittgenstein's uh, argument about familial resemblances. And I think Wittgenstein gives us a clue here about how we can think about uh, disciplines. And what Wittgenstein says is that uh, if you think about a class of things, for example, games or a family, all members of that class don't necessarily have the same set of characteristics. They draw, if you like, from a set that we recognize uh, so that we're able to recognize members of a family, we're able to recognize chess as a game, uh, but it's different. Uh, the person is different, the game is different from other uh, examples uh, 
uh, of games or families. So what we're learning is a set of characteristics that aren't necessarily uh, present. Um, and I'll come to the question of how we do that learning, how that learning occurs uh, in, a, in a minute. So to use that argument about disciplines, we could say that uh, we learn to recognize the characteristics of academic historians, for example, even though the articulation of academic history might be very different from one university to another. We can still recognize them as historians, just as we can recognize uh, drafts as a game and, and chess as a game, although they're uh, quite different. And of course, there are many other games that are uh, different too. So uh, this notion of familial resemblances, I think, is, uh, is quite useful when we, as, as a way of thinking about disciplines and the way they're differently articulated. Another point associated with that is that they can be different at different levels of analysis, or what Sayer calls different ontological strata. So that disciplines viewed from a distance, from the helicopter, if you like, uh, look to have a set of characteristics uh, that uh, one can identify. But one, when one lands the helicopter, those characteristics crumble away in the analytical hand. So the level of analysis, the ontological stratum that you're looking at, becomes uh, quite important. Granularity matters. Now that's a problem, that's an issue that you know, has been identified before. But again, I think uh, Wittgenstein's notion of familial 